16 gigs of RAM is 16 gigs of RAM, right? <laughs> You're gonna learn today. Good afternoon morning and welcome to Turbo Tortoise Tech. If you're new here, I'm Reese of the Four Piece Variety. We'll work you triple XL. And today's thing is, oh, it's, it's just so satisfying. I was gonna set out and do 20 benchmarks to prove the point, but after doing like five, it became very obvious that what was going on over here. So the idea for this piece of content really came up when I was doing the slay and having a look at the slay, the first look. If you want to see that, it is available on the channel and I go through all of the features of the case. But while I had the pre-board, I thought, let me do some benchmarking on something that you can buy directly from EveTech and then you know exactly what sort of performance and stuff you're going to get. And then I thought even further, let's make the point of doing dual channel versus single channel on the entry level because I've done it with very high end builds, 5900Xs with 3080s and it's quite obvious there that there are performance differences depending on your RAM setup. Even dual channel versus quad channel or dual two randoms versus four in AMD, there's no such thing as quad channel for that, it only exists in DDR5 environments or in server environments obviously, yeah, there's nothing on desktop that actually had quad channel just to be specific with that but four DIMMs versus two even showed a performance difference. So that's exactly what we set out to look at today. And just, I just did a couple of benchmarks and it was like mega, mega, mega obvious that two is just always gonna be better than one. Dual channel, even on an entry level A320 M-K, a very entry level motherboard with a 4650G and RTX 3050, a thousand Rand extra, on your invoice is going to give you like nearly 30% performance gains in certain instances. So let's talk about the set setup so you've got an idea. You can see the Antec HCG850, it's got a SN530 1TB NVMe, so there's no bottlenecks as far as storage goes. The little pallet 3050 in the system right now is the Clevcrass X3200 CL16 at its default timings. And the other memory module that we used was a Clev 16 gig 3200 CL22. Cast latency affects how fast the memory can respond to single core performance stuff, which is compounding our results over here. But this is what you'll get as your default random from Uncle Eve Tech if you do buy the pre-build with a 16 gig RAM setup. But on that pre-build select, for a thousand rand more, you can select a, a Clev Crass X RAM kit. You can even get the 3600 CL18s at a discount right now. So maybe consider those even. But just with these, I'm going to now demonstrate to you the, the massive performance gains you're going to get in gaming from going dual channel over single channel. So what I'm gonna do is show you the results on this PC over here, and then I will create an overlay with the game and with the relative results between the two DIMMs in front of you. So you can see even on 0.1%, we're going to go into the nitty gritties today between dual channel and single channel. So let's start off with CSGO, which was a really mm, more dead heat area than I, even I was expecting to be quite honest with you. So on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see the dual channel results versus the single channel results. Now CS is a very CPU bound game. It's way more CPU bound than pretty much any modern AAA title. I say modern for a nine year old game, but it's still in the modern era. It's still one of the most played games of all time. All right, and concurrently on Steam. So if you look at the average frame rate, we do see an increase from 243.3 to 261.5. Uh, there's no such thing as half a frame. So let's say it's 243 versus 26, 261. Half a frame means that it's tearing in the middle of the screen, which nobody wants to see anyway. So let's just take it at that, right? The minimum frame rate increased by one point. The maximum frame rate increased by eight points. So nothing much there. The 1% lows increase and the 0.1% increase. So every single frame rate that we're talking about here, every single layer did increase going CSGO to from, CS, from one at least to two in CSGO. But now for something a little bit uh, with a little bit of a further spread over there. So on the left of your screen, we're going to have the single channel results for Dota 2. And then on the right hand side, we'll have the dual channel results for Dota 2. 
I don't think I need to say much of here going from under 100 average to 127. Minimum frame rate increased also by nearly 20 FPS. On a scale of 60 to 80, that's a 30% increase. Just between the minimum and the maximum, you're getting 30% better performance with the exact same system with the exact same settings. Similarly, maximum frame rate increased by 30 points again, nearly from 113 to 144, it actually is 30 frame rate. 1% increased by nearly 20 FPS. What's that? That's 13 on the 56. Uh, that's about almost 30% once again, it's about 25, 30%. 44 to 47, not much to write home about there. I think that also just comes down to the processor itself. But you can see this is the first like giga win. Surely it doesn't happen again. Let me just go and consult Vermintide 2 and show you how much it just is consistent like that, especially where GPU performance is required. The single channel once again on the right hand side and dual channel once again on the left hand side. We're now going from 70 to 91 FPS. Minimum frame rate increased by 20 FPS again. 20 FPS. The minimum frame rate now is almost as good as the average frame rate from the single memory channel test. Okay. Similarly, maximum frame rate increased again by nearly 30%. 1% lows went, went way higher as well from 42 to 60. That's again like nearly, that's actually nearly 50% performance improvement compared to 42 FPS and the 0.1s improved ones again from 27 to 33. So there's improvements across the board and that's going from a triple A, like Dota is not really a triple A game. It's quite easy to run. You can see even with a half decent system like this and absolutely everything maxed out through one of my test has got a huge amount of particle effects and stuff. That's why I have the test set up like that. And even, even for that, it's still a 30% performance improvement. Now, the one area of AAA gaming where I didn't actually see that much of a performance increase was actually Metro Exodus, which is weird because on the high setting, uh, it doesn't have DLSS enabled, which may have been an interesting test. Things did improve though. I mean, minimums, if you compare minimums and maximums over here, it did get better and seemingly a little bit more stable. Those low down dips in the graph just seem to be a little bit better on the dual channel versus the single channel and a little less punctuated. It's like a little less fuzzy, especially in the early stages of the run. Even at the end here, you can see like there's there's definitely breaking up of it. So while it didn't improve hugely in FPS, the performance definitely did increase. And now lastly, using 3D Mark's very convenient compar online comparison, which does all the percentages for me, you can see a physics score improvement of 5%, 5% just by having that memory set up. This is why synthetics are not the be all and end all. They are a very good reference point for general performance improvements between different scaling hardware, whether it be CPU or GPU. For this sort of instance where RAM is at, where the RAM is being questioned over here, you can see the this gives us significantly diminishing returns. And that's why you can't just run a single benchmark and go, cool, that's the performance difference. It's gonna vary by title, which is what I'm showing you over here. But where there is variance, it's massive. And similarly, looking at time spy, now you see that gap get way, way, way better. The CPU performance improvement went from 6,000 to 7,000, 11.3% improvement as the instruction set gets harder. So as there's more like demand on the memory and the CPU for the CPU to be served up info with a low latency, then those gaps get bigger. Same thing is happening in Dota as it is in Vermintide 2. And that's going to be the case if you're playing Fortnite, if you're playing Battlefield, whatever game you are playing, you are going to see between, I would say, a five to as much as 30% as we've seen performance increase between just doing that. And what does that cost you overall on your system? At a thousand Rand, it's like seven and a half percent. Not not even, it's like almost, it's closer to about six and a half percent of your overall cost of your system increase, by increasing your cost of your system by about six percent, you're getting a guaranteed in areas 30 percent performance improvement. So it's not always about what graphics card you have or what CPU you've got. 4650G, this is a mid-range APU. It's not even built for gaming specifically. It's built more as like a crossover kind of chip. 
with a RTX, with a very entry level RTX 3050, 8 gig. There's nothing fancy in the system, except just that little bit of RAM change. Just do it, please, guys. I don't want to see baskets leaving intake with one RAM module in them. Please, I beg you, do it for yourself. If you want to render faster, get more memory. It's as simple as that. If you want to play games faster, get better, faster RAM. This is a really cheap way for you to get free performance, basically is what I'm telling you. Okay, cool, got it, good, thank you. If you have enjoyed this, please do hit us up with a like and subscribe. And I'll see you with more of this sort of content on the flip side. Again, I just don't know. I just don't know.